In the early morning haze over Hatfield Aerodrome in 1952, an aircraft sat poised like a silver bullet aimed at the future. Sleek, whisper quiet, and utterly unlike anything the skies had seen before, it had no roaring propellers, no piston engines, just four jet turbines embedded in its wings like a spacecraft from another world. As it rolled down the runway, its nose pointed toward the horizon. The world was about to change. This wasn't just a plane. It was a promise, a revolution, a risk. Its name was bold, almost mythic, the comet. And it would lift humanity into the jet age. But that ascent would come at a cost. This is the story of the de Havilland Comet the first commercial jet airliner, a marvel of engineering that raced ahead of its time, then came crashing back to Earth. The year is 1945. World War II has ended, and the skies belong to the propeller. Air travel, what little of it existed, was slow, turbulent, and deafening. Piston-powered aircraft lumbered across continents at under 300 miles per hour and at altitudes low enough to feel every bump of the Earth's atmosphere. Flying wasn't glamorous. It was noisy, cold, and rough. Reserved for the elite. Endured rather than enjoyed. But Britain was dreaming of something more. As America's Douglas DC-3 dominated post-war commercial aviation, British engineers and visionaries weren't content to compete. They wanted to leap ahead. Britain had independently invented the jet engine and now saw a once-in-a-century opportunity to revolutionize global aviation. The government formed the Brabazon Committee to lay out Britain's post-war aviation strategy. Among their recommendations was the audacious Type 4, a turbojet-powered airliner that could fly faster and higher than anything before it. That challenge fell to Sir Geoffrey de Havilland, whose name was already etched into the history of military aviation. But de Havilland wasn't interested in war machines anymore. He had a different vision, one of peace, of prestige, and of progress. He began designing an aircraft so radical that no existing engine could power it. So his team set out to build both the airframe and the engines from scratch. And so, the DH-106 Comet Project was born. After years of development, the first prototype took to the skies on July 27, 1949. It flew for just 31 minutes, but it was enough to send shock waves through the aviation world. Crowds at the Farnborough Air Show gawked as this futuristic jet soared past piston aircraft like a bird from another time. Its design was sleek and clean. Four turbojet engines were embedded within its wings, giving it a whisper-quiet profile and a look straight out of science fiction. The pressurized cabin featured large rectangular windows, offering breathtaking views at altitudes never before reached by civilians. By 1952, the comet was ready for commercial flight. On May 2nd, BOAC Flight 630 departed London for Johannesburg. Inside, passengers clinked glasses of champagne and marveled at the silence. There were no propellers, no rattle, no smoke, just smooth, vibrationless flight. The comet cruised at 40,000 feet, slicing the journey time in half. What once took a day and a half was now just six hours. This was flying as it had never been before. Lobster and caviar were served in polished cabins, crystal glasses, smiling hostesses, velvet carpet underfoot. The experience was closer to a cruise ship than an airplane. Royalty, Hollywood stars, and CEOs flocked to ride it, and every takeoff felt like a launch into the future. But every revolution has its shadows, and with each altitude climbed, so too rose the risks. On May 2nd, exactly one year after the comet's debut, BOAC Flight 783 disintegrated mid-air after takeoff from Calcutta, killing all 43 on board. Then, on January 10, 1954, BOAC Flight 781 vanished while cruising over the Mediterranean Sea, en route from Rome to London. Again, 35 people, gone, no warning, no mayday, just sudden violent destruction in the sky. 
Then, just three months later, another comet broke apart in the air after departing Rome for Cairo. Twenty-one lives lost. Three catastrophes in under 12 months. The aviation world was in disbelief. The plane that had promised the future was now a symbol of uncertainty. Headlines screamed. Airlines panicked. The entire comet fleet was grounded and the certificate of airworthiness revoked. But behind the scenes, a Herculean investigation began. The British Royal Aircraft Establishment initiated what was then the most intensive crash investigation in aviation history. Entire wrecks were salvaged from the seafloor. Engineers built the world's first full-scale pressurization test tank, cycling a comet fuselage thousands of times underwater to simulate years of flight. On the 3057th cycle, the fuselage cracked open. The verdict? Metal fatigue. It was something few truly understood in the 1950s. The repeated pressurization and depressurization of the cabin had created microscopic fractures around stress points, particularly the rectangular ADF antenna cutouts and, to a lesser extent, the iconic square windows. Over time, these cracks grew until, snap, the fuselage tore apart in flight. Further inspection revealed flawed riveting, thin fuselage skin, and overstressed joints. The comet had leapt too far ahead, pioneering a level of pressure, speed, and altitude that aviation engineering hadn't yet caught up to. Its brilliance had outpaced its blueprint. What came next reshaped aviation forever. The comet's disasters were not in vain. They forced the industry to grow up, fast. Design flaws were addressed head on. Square windows became oval. Fuselage skin was thickened. Redundant structural supports were added, engineers learned to model crack propagation, test for metal fatigue, and build with safety margins unimagined a decade before. Planes began to be built with fail-safe design principles, meaning that if one component failed, the structure could still hold together. And non-destructive testing, techniques like X-rays and ultrasonic inspection, became standard. In 1958, the Comet 4 was unveiled. Stronger, safer, more refined, it returned to service on transatlantic routes and restored, at least briefly, Britain's pride in the skies. But the world had moved on. While Britain rebuilt, America had been watching. Boeing engineers had taken careful notes. The result? The Boeing 707, an aircraft that would take everything the Comet pioneered and do it better. It was bigger, carried more passengers, had longer range, and perhaps most importantly, it mounted its engines on pylons beneath the wings, reducing the risk of wing damage during engine failure and making maintenance far easier. The 707 was a commercial knockout. Pan Am, TWA, and other global airlines raced to place orders. The jet age now had a new flag bearer, and it was American. The Comet, despite its improvements, couldn't compete. It was never able to shake its troubled past. Production wound down in 1964, and it faded from frontline commercial service by the 1980s. But the Comet's story wasn't over. In the 1960s, de Havilland's groundbreaking airframe was reborn. The Royal Air Force commissioned a new aircraft, the Hawker Siddeley Nimrod, based on the Comet's design. It was transformed into a maritime patrol aircraft capable of anti-submarine warfare, surveillance, and search and rescue missions. The Nimrod flew until the 2010s, giving the Comet lineage a service life of over six decades. It proved what many had long suspected. The Comet wasn't a failure. It was a blueprint, an idea ahead of its time. Flawed, yes, but visionary. To call the comet a failure is to fundamentally misunderstand its role in history. It was the first, the brave first, the aircraft that dared to soar where no one had flown before. Yes, it fell, but in doing so, it forced the world to reckon with aviation's hidden dangers. It taught Boeing, it taught Airbus, it taught everyone that innovation without understanding is risk, that progress requires humility, Without the Comet, Boeing engineers have admitted they might have suffered the same fate. The Comet's trials reshaped aviation. Every jet that has flown since, from the 707 to the Dreamliner, 
from Concorde to Air Force One, owes something to the comet. Today, surviving comets sit in museums, like the Royal Air Force Museum and the de Havilland Museum. Their wings still, their cockpits silent, but their story echoes every time you step into a pressurized cabin, every time you soar above 30,000 feet in comfort and safety. The comet flew too high, too soon, and because it did, we all fly better.